Hello, fourth grade. This is Mrs. Smith with Mrs. Newton today. She is going to be reading to us from Harry Potter, pages 171, sorry, 271 to 280. We want to thank Scholastic Books for allowing us to read this. Um, so yeah, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, written by J.K. Rowling, illustrated by Mary Grandem Free. So here we go. Here's Mrs. Newton. You may read along if you want to. You're right, Harry, said Hermione in a small voice. I'll use the invisible cloak, said Harry. It's just lucky. I got it back. But will it cover all three of us, said Ron? All, all three of us? Oh, come off it. You don't think we'll let you go alone? Of course not, said Hermione briskly. How do you think you'll get to the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. But if we get caught, you two will be expelled too. Not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. Flickwick told me in secret that I got 112% on his exam. They're not throwing me out, of, out after that. After dinner, the three of them sat nervously apart in the common room. Nobody bothered them. None of the Gryffindors had anything to say to Harry anymore after that. This was the first night he hadn't been upset by it. Hermione was skimming through all of her notes, hoping to come across one of the enchantments they were about to try to break. Harry and Ron didn't talk much. Both of them were thinking about what they were about to do. Slowly, the room emptied as people drifted off to bed. Better get the cloak, Ron muttered as Lee Jordan finally left, stretching and yawning. Harry ran upstairs to their dark dormitory. He pulled out the cloak and then his eyes fell on the flute Hagrid had given him for Christmas. He pocketed it in to use on Fluffy. He didn't feel much like singing. He ran back to the common room. We'd better get the cloak on here and make sure it covers all three of us. It flips spots one of our feet wandering along on its own. What are you doing, said a voice in the corner of the room. Neville appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor the Toad, who looked as though he'd been making another bid for freedom. Nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry, hurriedly putting the cloak behind his back. Neville stared at their guilty faces. You're going out again, he said. No, 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 said Hermione. No, we're not. Why don't you go to bed, Neville? Harry looked at the grandfather clock by the door. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. Camp might even now be playing fluffy to sleep. You can't go out, said Neville. You'll be caught again. Gryffindorf will be even more trouble. You don't understand, said Harry. This is important. But Neville was clearly feeling himself to do something desperate. I won't let you do it, he said, hurriedly to stand in front of the portrait hole. I'll, I'll fight you. Neville, Ron exploded, get away from that hole and don't be an idiot. Don't you call me an idiot, said Neville. I don't think you should be breaking any more rules. And you were the one who told me to stand up to people. Yes, but not to us, said Ron in exasperation. Neville, you don't know what you're doing. He took a step forward and Neville dropped Trevor the Toad who leapt out of sight. Go on then, try and hit me, said Neville, raising his fist. I'm ready. Harry turned to Hermione. Do something, he said desperately. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wand. Petrus Totalus, she cried, pointing it at Neville. Neville's arms snapped to his sides. His legs sprang together, his whole body rigid. He swayed where he stood and then fell flat on his face, stiff as a board. Hermione ran to turn him over. Neville's jaws were jammed together, so he couldn't speak. Only his eyes were moving, looking at them in horror. What have you done to him, Harry whispered. It's the full body bind, said Hermione miserably. Oh, Neville, I'm so sorry. We had to do it, Neville. No time to explain, said Harry. You'll understand later, Neville, said Ron, as they stepped over him and pulled on the invisible cloak. But leaving Neville lying motionless on the floor, didn't feel like a very good omen. In the nervous state, every statue shadow looked like flip. Every distant breath of wind sounded like keys swooping down on them. At the foot of the first steps, they spotted Mr. Norris sulking near the top. 
Oh, let's pick her just this once. Ron whispered in Harry's ear, but Harry shook his head as they climbed carefully around her. Mrs. Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Keys was bobbling halfway up, loosening the carpet so the people would trip. Who's there, he said suddenly. As they climbed toward him, he narrowed his wicked black eyes. No, you're there, even if I can't see you. Are you a googly or ghostly, or a wee student beastie? He rose up in the air and floated there, squinting at them. Should I call Flitz? I should, if something's a creeping around and seeing. Harry had a sudden idea. He said in a hoarse whisper, the bloody Baron has his own reasons for, for being invisible. He almost fell out of the air and stopped. He caught himself in time and hovered about a foot off the stairs. So sorry your bloodiness, Mr. Baron, sir, he said briefly. My mistake, my mistake. I didn't see you. Of course I didn't. You're invisible. Forgive old Peavy, his little joke, sir. I have business here, Peeves, croaked Harry. Stay away from this place tonight. I will, sir. I most certainly will, said Peeves, rising up in the air again. Hope your business goes well, Baron. I'll not bother you. And he scooted off. Brilliant, Harry, whispered Ron. A few seconds later, they were there, outside the third floor corridor, and the door was already ajar. Well, there you are, Harry said quietly. Champ's already got past Fluffy. Seeing the open door somehow seemed to impress upon all three of them what was facing them underneath the cloak. Harry turned to the other two. If you want to go back, I won't blame you, he said. You can take the cloak. I won't need it now. Don't be stupid, said Ron. We're coming, said Hermione. Harry pushed the door open. As the door creaked, low, rumbling growls met their ears. All three of the dogs' noses sniffed madly in the direction, even though it couldn't see them. What's that at its feet, Hermione whispered. Look, looks like a heart, said Ron. Snap must have left it here. It must wake up the moment you stop playing, said Harry. Well, here goes. He put Hagrid's flute to his lips and blew. It wasn't really a tune, but from the first note, the beast's eyes began to droop. Harry hardly drew breath. Slowly, the dog's growls ceased. It tottered on his paws and fell to his knees. Then it slumped to the ground, fast asleep. Keep playing, Ron warned Harry as they slipped out of the cloak and crept for the trap door. They could feel the dog's hot, smelly breath as they approached the giant's head. I think we'll be able to pull the door open, said Ron, peering over the dog's black dog's back. Want to go first, Hermione? No, I don't. All right, Ron gritted his teeth and stepped carefully over the dog's legs. He bent and pulled the ring of the trap door, which swung up and open. What can you see, Hermione said anxiously. Nothing, just black. There's no way of climbing down. We'll just have to drop. Harry, who was still playing the flute, waved at Ron to get his attention and pointed at himself. You want to go first? Are you sure? Said Ron. I don't know how deep this thing goes. Give the flute to Hermione so she can keep him asleep. Harry handed the flute over. In a few seconds, silent, the dog growled and clicked. But the moment Hermione began to play, it fell back into its deep sleep. Harry climbed over it and looked down through the trap door. There was no sign of bottom. He lowered himself through the hole until he was hanging on by his fingertips. Then he looked up at Ron and said, if anything happens to me, don't follow. Go straight to the owlery and send Hedwig to Dumbledore, right? Right, said Ron. See you in a minute, I hope. And Harry let go. Cold, damp air rushed past him as he fell down, 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 and plump, with a funny muffled sort of lump, he landed on something soft. He sat up and felt around. His eyes not used to the gloom, he felt as though he was sitting on some sort of plant. It's okay, he called up to the light, the size of a postage stamp, which was the open trap door. It's a soft landing. You can jump. Ron called right away. He landed sprawled next to Harry. What's this stuff? were his first words. Don't know, some sort of plant thing. I suppose it's here to break the fall. Come on, Hermione. The distant music stopped. There was a loud bark from the dog, but Hermione had already jumped. She landed on Harry's other side. 
We must be miles under the school, she said. Lucky this plant thing's here, really, said Ron. Lucky, shrieked Hermione. Look at you both. She slipped up and struggled toward the damp wall. She had to struggle because the moment she had landed, the plant started to twist snake-like tentacles around her ankles. As for Harry and Ron, their legs had already been bound tightly in long creepers without their noticing. Hermione had managed to free herself before the plant got a firm grip on her. Now she watched in horror as the two boys fought to pull the plant off them. But the more they strained against it, the tighter and faster the plant wound around them. Stop moving, Hermione ordered them. I know what this is. It's devil snare. Oh, I'm so glad we know what it's called. That's great help, snarled Ron, leaning back, trying to stop the plant from curling around his neck. Shut up. I'm trying to remember how to kill it, said Hermione. Well, hurry up. I can't breathe. Harry grasped, wrestling with it as it curled around his chest. Devil snare. Devil snare. What did Professor Sprout say? It's like the dark and the damp. Don't light a fire, Harry choked. Yes, of course. But there's no wood, Hermione cried, wringing her arms. Have you got a man, Ron bellowed? Are you a witch or not? All right, said Hermione said Hermione, and she whipped out her wand, waved it, muttered something, and sent a jet of steam, bluebell flames she had used on snap at the plant. In a matter of seconds, the two boys felt it loosening its grip as it turned away from the light and warmth. Wriggling and failing, it unraveled itself from their bodies, and they were able to pull free. Lucky you pay attention in herb herb herbology, Hermione said, Harry, as he joined her by the wall, wiping sweat off his face. Yeah said Ron, and lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. This way, said Harry, pointing down a stone passageway, which was the only way forward. As they could hear apart from their footsteps was a dense, gentle drip of water trickling down the wall. The passageway sloped downward, and Harry was reminded of Grignot, with an unpleasant gulp of the heart. He remembered the dragon said to be guarding vaults in the wizard's bank. If they met a dragon, a fully grown dragon, Norbert had been bad enough. Can you hear something, Ron whispered? Harry listened. A soft rustling and clinking seemed to be coming from up ahead. Do you think it's a ghost? I don't know. Sounds like wings to me. There's light ahead. I can see something moving. They reached the end of the passageway and saw before them a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceiling arching high above them. It was full of small, dual bright birds, fluttering and tumbling all around them. On the opposite side of the chamber was a heavy wooden door. Do you think they'll attack us if we cross the room, said Ron? Probably, said Harry. They don't look very vicious, but I suppose if they all swoop down at once, well, there's no other choice. Oh, Ron. He took a deep breath, covered his face with his arms, and squinted across the room. He expected to feel sharp beaks and claws tearing at him any second, but nothing happened. He reached the door untouched. He pulled the handle, but it was locked. The other two followed. They tugged and heaved at the door, but it wouldn't bulge, not even when Hermione tried her Alamora charm. Now what, said Ron. These birds, they can't be here just for decoration, said Hermione. They watched the birds soaring overhead, glittering, glittering. They're not birds. Harry said something. They're keys. Winged keys. Look carefully. So that must mean he looked around the chamber while the other two squinted up at the flock of keys. Yeah, look, broomstick. We've got to catch the keys to the door. But there are hundreds of them, Ron explained. Examine the door in the lock. We're looking for a big old fashioned one, probably silver like the handle. And kicked off into the air, soaring into the midst of the cloud of keys. They grabbed and snatched, but the bewitched keys darted and dived so quickly it was almost impossible to catch one. Not for nothing, though, was Harry, the youngest seeker in a century. He had the knack for spotting things other people didn't. After a minute's weaving about through the whirl of rainbow feathers, he noticed a large silver key that had a bent wing, as if it had already been caught and stuffed roughly in the keyhole. That one, he called Harry. That big one. 
there, no, there, was the bright blue wing. The feathers were crumbled on one side. Ron went speeding in the direction where Harry was pointing. Crashed into the ceiling and nearly fell off his broom. We've got to close in on it, Harry called, not taking his eyes off the scene with the damage. Room. Ron, you come in from above. Hermione, stay below and stop it from going down. And I'll try to catch it right now. Ron died. Hermione rocketed up and they two dodged them both. And Harry streaked after it. It sped toward the wall. Harry leaned forward and with a nasty, crunching noise, pinned it against the stone with one hand. Ron and Hermione's spears echoed around the high chamber.